in what God called them to do. And I tell you, that's, that's a blessing that people were willing to humble themselves and admit it and make a commitment that I'm going to find out. But at the same time, it's sad to think that people live for decades just basically kind of going their own way and hoping that it's pleasing to God when God wants to reveal himself to you. I really made a point last night of saying that before you were formed in the womb, God had a purpose for your life. And it's not up to you to just do what you want to and ask God to bless it and hope that it was pleasing to him. God wants to reveal himself to you. And when you receive this, which I believe a lot of people really received this teaching last night and made a commitment that they want to know what God's will for them is. When, when you do that, it raises all kinds of questions. Larry and I were talking as we walked down here today about, um, you know, it'll be interesting in heaven to see what could have been, what should have been, what God's will was. Like these 50 million babies that had been aborted since Roe versus Wade in the United States. What was God's plan for them? What great discoveries would they have made? You know, just in the natural, you can think about if we had 50 million people paying into Social Security right now, we wouldn't have a Social Security problem. We wouldn't have a lot of problems that we've got in this nation. And those things are just obvious. But what about their potential? Some of these people were going to be... Great leaders. Who knows what God's plan was for their life? And they've been aborted and never even given the opportunity. And so this raises questions about, uh, you know, can you mess up God's will so much that you can't get back to where God wanted you to be? And, and honestly, I don't have a good answer for this. I was talking to a couple of people out there this morning. And they were asking me, they, they married some people that, you know, I don't know all the circumstances, but the, the husband isn't as excited about the Lord as they are. And now they made a commitment, they want to find God's will, but what do I do about my husband? What do I do about my mate? Um, you know, there's, we can get our lives so complicated that it's hard to figure out how do I get from here over there. And you know what? I had to tell him, I said, look, I'm not insensitive to what you're saying, but I do know that God had an original purpose and you may not have followed it. And it may be hard at first to recognize that I've been doing some things that maybe they're good, but they aren't God. And there has to be some adjustments. And sometimes you can't just unscramble eggs. Sometimes you just got to deal with it and you got to go on. And so I want to share some things with you today that hopefully will help answer a couple of these questions and help deal with some things. Um, it's hard to, you know, get into what might have been, could have been. And I think that in some ways it could be detrimental for you to start thinking about, man, what, you know, if I would have followed God, what if I hadn't have turned back here and all of these things. Those things, Satan can beat you up over that. And so I want to share some things that hopefully will help you today. Let's turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 13. And this is an amazing passage of Scripture. God has really spoken to me through this. But in 1 Samuel chapter 13, this is right after Saul was anointed to be king. And if you aren't familiar with that story, it was really miraculous. Saul was just a guy out looking for some of his livestock that had been lost. And he decided he'd go ask the prophet Samuel about, uh, did he have any word from God about where his lost donkeys were? And when he went to see Samuel, Samuel had been told by the Lord that tomorrow I'm going to send you a man who will be the ruler over the nation and you'll make him the next king. And so Saul walked in. Samuel already had this huge feast prepared and a lot of food set aside for Saul. And he gave it all to Saul and took Saul home, talked to him. And uh, said, you're the one who's going to be king. And Saul couldn't believe it. Saul didn't want to be king. And yet God gave him all of these supernatural things. I mean, like five or six things. You're going to leave here and you'll meet three men coming down from a hill. And they'll be carrying a bottle of wine and a loaf of bread. And, and they'll do all of this. And, and I mean, he gave him so many miraculous signs that it was impossible for it to just happen coincidentally. And when Saul left there, every one of those things came to pass. And the scripture says that God gave Saul another heart. Boy, there's some great teaching in all of that. Those are great things. But Saul was anointed. And when he was 
called out. Samuel did this in a real dramatic way. He called all twelve of the tribes of Israel by, and he chose the tribe of Benjamin. And then he took the tribe of Benjamin and took all of the fathers, all of the heads of the families, and brought them by, and he cho- chose the tribe of Kish. And then he had all of the people in Kish's family come by, and he chose Saul, and Saul wasn't there. And so he inquired, and he says, where is he? And the Lord said, he's hiding. And they went, and he was hiding in a basket because he was so embarrassed. And Samuel went and found him in this basket and took him out of the basket and stood him there. And he says, behold, your king. And the people thought, this is going to be our king. The guy's been hiding in a basket. And so anyway, there was a lot of people that didn't accept him, but there is a situation where Nahash, this uh, foreign king, came down and attacked one of the cities. And Saul, the spirit of the Lord, came upon him and he took a yoke of oxen and cut it into 12 pieces and sent one piece to each one of the tribes. And he says, I'm going to do this to your animals if you don't come and follow me. And the spear of God fell on all of those people and they turned out as if it was one man. Every person came out and they defeated this king and it saved the nation and it was a, a tremendous victory. And so then the whole nation rallied after Saul and he became this great uh, king and was very powerful. So that's the background of all of this. And in chapter 13, it says Saul reigned one year and when he had reigned two years, Over Israel, Saul chose him out 3,000 men, and he began to start governing the nation. And then it says um, that the Philistines came down in verse 5, and in verse 6, when the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places And in pits, and some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of uh, Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. So here the Philistines had come down against them, and boy, Saul and the Israelites were in bad shape, and they were hiding some of them, defected, and went over to other nations for protection, and it was a crisis situation. In verse 8, it says, And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Samuel had told Saul that I'm coming, and he was going to offer a sacrifice and implore the Lord for blessing as they went out to fight their enemies. And Saul waited the set time, but Samuel didn't show up on time. And, you know, I don't understand exactly whether Samuel missed it, Or possibly this was God that delayed Samuel just to see if Saul was going to do the right thing or not. You know, it doesn't tell us who was right and who was wrong. But I can guarantee you, Saul was wrong in overstepping his bounds and stepping into the office of a priest. Uh, In Leviticus chapter 10, I believe it is, even two of Aaron's sons who were priests and who were anointed by God to offer sacrifices... If you didn't do it with a pure heart, if you did it with wrong motives, fire came out from the altar and killed Nadab and Abihu. And uh, so these were priests that were called to do it. But if you weren't holy, I guarantee you it was a dangerous thing. Now, here's a man who wasn't even anointed to be a priest. He was anointed to be king, and he totally overstepped his bounds and took authority upon him that he didn't have, and he offered a sacrifice. And so that's the background of this. In verse 9, it says, And Saul said, Bring me hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash, therefore said I, The Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. He forced himself. You know, this terminology means that he knew it was wrong. He knew he wasn't supposed to do it. He had to force himself is what he's saying. And what he did was basically say, I normally wouldn't have done this, but the situations dictated it. And so he was forced into doing it. You know, this is a 
it reveals a character flaw. And I tell you, this is, this is true of many, many, many people today. You could apply this to what I was talking about earlier about giving. There's people who know that they're supposed to give. But yet, in a hard situation, well, I just couldn't help it. I had to have this money. There are people that don't have any integrity, and they will violate what they know is wrong if they think that that is to their immediate best interest. But you know, you need to be a person of integrity that if God tells you to give, then you know what? That's non-negotiable. You just give. And if you starve, well, that's okay. You're going to give. Thank you for that thunderous silence. There's not many people that run their life this way. It's like, well, I wanted to do this and I would do it if. See, this is what Paul, Saul was saying. I, I knew I wasn't supposed to do it, but the Philistines were going to come down. I hadn't entreated the Lord. I hadn't offered a sacrifice. There's always an excuse. If you are the type of person that an excuse can make you deviate from what's right, then you will. But you just need to get to a place where you drive a stake in the ground and say, this is non-negotiable. You know, I was, I was using that example one time and I said something about driving a stake in the ground. And I had a person come up to me who was an Indian. And he said, do you know where that comes from? And I said, no. And he's, I forgot what tribe of Indian, but he says that the tribe of Indian that he descended from, when they got into a battle and it looked like that they were outnumbered and then that the people, the Indians might want to run what they would do is drive a stake in the ground and tie themselves to that stake so that they couldn't run and they had to stand and fight to the death. That's where that comes from when you say that I'm going to drive a stake in the ground. You just need to drive a stake in the ground and say, you know what, if God told me to do this, if God told me to do something, I'll stand here and I'll do it if it kills me. I am not going to compromise. I will not change. If you have compromise in you, you will. You just need to get to a place where there are some things that are non-negotiable. I am not going to compromise. I will not do this. And some are saying, well, I can't do that. Yes, you can. Just pull your thumb out of your mouth and grow up and just stand for something. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. See, Saul knew he wasn't supposed to do this. He forced himself and he had an excuse or reason. Oh, it sounds good that I need to implore the Lord. But you know what? You need to obey God more than you need to do, plead and ask for him to do something. He compromised. He did not do what God told him to do. And look at this in verse 13. Samuel said to Saul, thou hast done foolishly. For thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom over Israel forever. Those of you that are familiar with Bible history, David was chosen to replace Saul. And you know what? Jonathan was Saul's son. And in the 14th chapter of 1 Samuel, Jonathan, they were... You know, after all of this is over, the Philistines are still out there. They're still in this desperate situation. And all of the Israelites are hiding in caves and in pits. And so Jonathan just stands up and he says, it's no restraint to God, whether to save by many or by few. And so Jonathan and his armor bearer crawled up to this rock where the Philistines were. And he just started fighting the Philistines. And he killed about 20 of the Philistines. And God caused fear to enter into them. And all of the Philistines fled. And all of a sudden, Saul and all of the Israelites that were hiding in the caves rose up and started chasing them. And there was this huge deliverance. Jonathan was a powerful man of God that put his life on the line. And when David went out and killed Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17, did you know that Jonathan who was the king's son, the one who stood to inherit the kingdom, he went and took off his shield and his armor and his sword and gave it all to David. And he loved David. And he said, I know you're going to be king. And Jonathan humbled himself when this guy was his replacement. Very few people would do that. Jonathan was such a godly man. He's one of the greatest godly examples in the Bible. He would have made an awesome king. But his father blew it. For him and for himself, Samuel is saying, if you would have obeyed God today, you would have ruled over Israel forever. Did you know that there never would have been a David? We would have never heard of David. David wasn't God's first choice. 
The reason I'm bringing this up is because when we start talking about that God has a destiny for you and you've got to find out what God called you to do. Did you know Saul wasn't just a temporary king until David could come along? Saul was God's first choice. God chose Saul. And it says right here, the prophet saying, if you would have obeyed God today, your kingdom, you would have ruled over Israel forever. We would be singing about the sure mercies of Saul today. We would be talking about Saul as being the great man of God. And we would have never even heard of David. Here's my point. David wasn't God's first choice. David was a second choice. And yet, look how awesome David was. Look what God did with second best. Man, God established the nation and David became this mighty man of God. The man after God's own heart. In the next verse, it says in verse 14, But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded him. You know, if you were to study all of this out, the first verse of this 13th chapter says this was in the second year of Saul's reign. Saul reigned for 40 years. And when David became king at the end of Saul's reign, David was uh, 30 years old. And so this was the second year of his reign. If you subtract all of those numbers, did you know that when this was spoken, this is eight years before David was born. And God says he sought him out, a man after his own heart. And God said I, he has commanded him. David wasn't even conceived yet. It was eight years before he was conceived. And yet God had commanded him to take over. David was born to be king. He had a purpose. But you know what? It wasn't the first choice. It was actually a reaction to somebody else who failed to do what God called him to do. So I bring all of this up just to say... That we can't really second guess and say what could have been, would have been, should have been. You know what? God can take wherever you are today. And if you've missed God, if you would submit yourself to God, God's plan B for your life could be better than you could have ever imagined plan A would be. And you know, as Larry was sharing with me, he says, you know what? Regardless of how upset people get, you can't get to God's perfect will for your life any quicker than just to start right now. Amen. If you realize that you've wasted some time and blown it, well, you can't go back and just think about what might have been and all these other things. Just start seeking God. And you can't get there any quicker than to just start today and make yourself totally committed unto God. So here's an example of God had a perfect will. And Saul was God's first choice. And yet Saul didn't cooperate with God and he missed God's will for his life. Those people who think that God sovereignly moves everything and that things just automatically work out, I don't know how they reconcile this. I don't know how they reconcile like the Jews coming out of the land of Egypt. And the scripture makes it very clear that God never intended for them to spend 40 years in the wilderness, but they did because of their choice, because they rebelled at God. That wasn't God's will. He told them to go into the promised land. And they said, no, no, the giants are over there. We can't do it. That wasn't God's will for them. And yet, God was able to work things around. You know, it was God's will for Moses to lead the children of Israel into the land of Egypt. But Moses missed it. Moses got mad at the Jews and smote the rock instead of speaking to it the second time. And because of that, God wouldn't let Moses lead them in. But that was his first choice. But he raised up Joshua. And look how successful Joshua was. Joshua was a powerful man and God used him. And we look at this and think, well, this is exactly the way that God wanted it. No, Joshua was not God's first choice. Moses was God's first choice and Moses didn't fulfill everything that God told him to do. You can sit there and criticize Moses, but you know what? He did more than most of us have ever done. Most of us haven't split the Red Sea. Amen. Most of us haven't seen the death angel pass over and stuff. You know what? Moses didn't do it perfectly. I'm not sure that God has ever had anybody qualified working for him yet. I'm not sure that any of us have reached our full potential. And yet God is so awesome that he takes us and what little we submit to, God is able to take it and use it to accomplish his will. 
And so I'm saying this to say that, you know, if you feel like, well, man, I just messed up my life. I've missed it so badly. Here's an example of God taking a situation that was not his will, and yet he was able to work it out, and he was able to bring his will to pass. Look over here in 2 Samuel chapter 13, or chapter 12, I guess it is. 2 Samuel. This is where David sinned with Bathsheba. And most of you are familiar with that, that David... Quit doing what God told him to do, basically. It says over here in chapter 11, look at this, it says in verse 1, And it came to pass, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle. In other words, you know, they they didn't have some of the advantages that we had today, and so they had to wage war when you could wage war, and and they didn't do it during the winter and things like this. This was the springtime or something, and it was time for kings to go forth to battle. David was the king. He should have gone to battle. But you know what? He had become so prosperous, he had generals and people under him and all of these mighty men that he didn't have to do what God had called him to do. He stayed home. He wasn't doing what God called him to do. He got out of his calling. And, you know, let me just make a point here. And this is really, really important. Did you know when David was running from Saul for his life and it looked like that his whole life could be taken away. He could die at any moment. Did you know he sought God with his whole heart and he was pure? But when he became king and all of a sudden he had accomplished all of this and he had basically subdued all of his enemies. Did you know that during David's reign that Damascus in Syria was conquered by him and he ruled over it? David extended the borders of the nation of Israel further than any other king. He was prosperous, successful, like no other king had ever been. And he just won every battle that he fought. Everything worked. God blessed him. And here is one awesome truth that you need to get hold of. That the greatest temptation you will ever face in your life is when you're successful. Hardship is not... The, the worst situation in your life. Anybody with even a minimal commitment to the Lord will seek the Lord when pressure is on and it looks like they're going to fail. You know what is the greatest test of your character is not hardship, but success. When everything is going good and the pressure is off and you don't have to seek God because it looks like everything is just going your way, that will reveal what's really in your heart. Are you going to seek God as strong as when everything is good as you do when it's bad? You know, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on this, but just in your heart, answer this question. When is it that you seek God the most? With most people, it's when you're in trouble. When you realize that, God, I'm facing a disaster. I can't do this. Oh, God, help me. But when everything's going good... Most people forget God. They don't seek the Lord. They don't pray. They don't study the Word. They don't spend as much time. And that you are at your most vulnerable when everything is going good because you tend not to recognize your need for God. David, everything was going so good in his life, he was able to send his generals out there. And David stayed at home and didn't do what God called him to do. And look at this. It says in the last part of that verse... Or, excuse me, he's tarried home at Jerusalem. And in verse 2 it says, And it came to pass in the eventide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. Now, let me ask you this. If you are just getting up when the sun is going down, what have you been doing? You've been sleeping during the day. You know what? David was bored. David wasn't doing what God called him to do. He was so prosperous, he was sleeping all day and staying up all night, and that leads to trouble. You know what? If he'd have been going to bed like a normal person, if he would have been judging the people and doing the kingly things that God called him to do, if he was out fighting his battles, this temptation wouldn't have even come. You know, we got this saying about the idle mind is the devil's workshop, and there's a lot of truth to that. And David was bored, and David was sleeping during the day, and he was up just looking for something, and he spied Bathsheba. And so he went out, committed adultery with her, and then she got pregnant. And in order to cover up his sin, rather than him admitting what he had done and humbling himself, he sent for Uriah, 
Bathsheba's husband, who was one of his three mighty men over in 1 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel 23, you can read about it. And Uriah was one of the mighty men of David that fought and protected him and did things. And he sent for one of his greatest generals and brought him home so that he could go in and have a relationship with his wife. And hopefully that child would be credited to Uriah and not to him. And yet Uriah was such a noble man that he slept at the door of David. He didn't go home. And David was shocked. So the next morning he called him in. He says, why didn't you go home to your wife? And he says, the Ark of the Covenant and Joab, the general of all of the forces and all of his friends are out there fighting. And he says, and should I go home and lie with my wife and take pleasure? He says, I won't do it. He, this man was committed and he felt an obligation to all of the other troops. And so David got him drunk, made him drink until he got him drunk, thinking that when he gets drunk, then he'll violate this and he'll go home to his wife and I'll be able to use that as an excuse. And did you know what? Even though Uriah got drunk, he still laid down at David's door and slept and refused to go home. So what David did was write a note to Joab and say, Joab put Uriah in the hottest part of the battle where there is a lot of fighting and then have your men withdraw from him so that he'll be killed. And he wrote the note and sent it by Uriah because he knew Uriah was such an honest man and a man of integrity that Uriah wouldn't even read the note. And he is able to carry his own death sentence. Boy, this is major. Major bad. This is a man after God's own heart. Now, that wasn't after God's own heart. But you know what? It shows you that even a person who has a heart for God can really get off track. And when you get to where everything is going good in your life, when it looks like everything is awesome, is when you are your weakest. You're your most vulnerable. Whenever, when the pressure is on, if you have a real commitment to the Lord, you will seek God under pressure. So you need to, be, you need to recognize that, man, when things are going good, you ought to seek God even more. You ought to humble yourself even more. You ought to be more God-dependent than you've ever been in your life. But David got totally off track and committed adultery and then murdered a man to cover up his adultery. And it says in the last verse, the last part of this last verse of the 11th chapter, but the thing which David had done displeased the Lord. Boy, that's putting it mildly. God was ticked off. And so in the 12th chapter, you find that God sent Nathan the prophet and exposed what David had done. And the way he had done, the way he exposed it was he gave him a parable about this rich man who had all of these cattle and sheep and everything. And he had all of this abundance. And he had a neighbor who was so poor that all he had was a little tiny ewe lamb that he had raised as if it was his own. He had nursed it and fed it. And this was like a daughter to him. And this rich man had somebody come to his house. And rather than the rich man taking one of his sheep and killing it to feed the stranger, he went to this neighbor who was so poor and took this little ewe lamb that was like his own daughter and killed it to feed this person. And David got so incensed, he says, this man that has done this thing is going to pay this back multiple times and I'm going to kill him for what he did. You know, this is the way it is with hypocrites. They strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. He had committed adultery and murdered to cover up his adultery, and yet he was going to kill a man who had gone and stolen his neighbor's little lamb so that he could feed somebody. And, you know, I'm reading between the lines here. I won't take a lot of time on this, but you know what I believe happened? The Scripture says God will show mercy to those who have given mercy, but to those who haven't shown mercy, he will have no mercy. You know what I believe was happening? I believe that the reason this came out in parable form God basically let David prescribe his own judgment. If David would have been merciful, if David would have said, well, you know, there needs to be some restitution here, but we're going to show mercy towards this man. I believe he would have gotten mercy. But David would show no mercy. And he says, the man that has done this is going to die. Kill him. And you know what happened? The child that was born to Bathsheba died. David prescribed his own judgment. David dictated that. God let him pronounce judgment. And so Nathan went ahead and said, you are the man. Boy, I'd have loved to have been there. 
I'd have loved to have been there when David was so incensed. I can imagine his face became red and here he is yelling, how dare a man kill his neighbor's sheep? And Nathan says, you are the man. I'd like to have seen that reaction. And he went on and, boy, there's just, there, this is really powerful. It's hard for me not to preach on this because God has spoken this to me so many times. But um, anyway, the child died. David interceded for him saying, how do you know that the Lord won't have mercy on him? So he fasted for seven days. Finally, the child died and, and he got over it. And then look at this in the 12th chapter, 2 Samuel in verse 22, after the death of this child, it says, in verse, let's go down to verse 24. And David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in unto her and lay with her, and she bare a son, and they called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him. And he, talking about the Lord, sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet and called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. The word Jedidiah means beloved of the Lord. Now think about this. This relationship with Bathsheba was totally not God. Totally. It was an adulterous relationship and David murdered Bathsheba's husband to try and cover this up. This was an adulterous relationship. It was not God. And yet, after it was over, after David repented, you know what, there's a lot of people that think, well, you just should divorce. You should get rid of this woman because it was all started wrong. But you know what, David had made a commitment to her. And once he repented, this relationship was sanctioned by God. David went in to Bathsheba. The child that was born was named Solomon, but Nathan called him Jedidiah, beloved of God. And Solomon became David's replacement and the next king and was raised up. And Solomon was the one who had the vision come unto him and the Lord... I'll give you anything. And he says, I want wisdom to govern these people. And it blessed God and pleased him so much. He says, because you didn't ask for the neck of your enemies, because you didn't ask for long life, because you didn't ask for prosperity, I've given you all the things you didn't ask for. Plus, I've granted your request for wisdom. And God used Solomon. Solomon was never God's will. Originally. God never wanted David to have Bathsheba. God never wanted David to kill Uriah. God never wanted this whole relationship, but after they had done this, they repented and God took the child that was born to David and Bathsheba and it became Solomon. And man, he's a part of all of our lives. We've all heard of the wisdom of Solomon. He became so prosperous that in his days they didn't even take any account of silver. They threw it on the street like a rock. Because they had gold, drinking vessels. Silver was worth nothing in his day. Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. And it says that Solomon was the richest man that will ever live. Not only the richest man of his day, but there is nobody today that even approaches the wisdom and the riches of Solomon. And all of this came to a person who was totally outside of God's original purpose and will. Saul was God's original purpose. David was second best. Then David blew it. And I guarantee you, this relationship with Bathsheba was never God's will for David. And yet, after they repented of it, God blessed this. And Bathsheba is the one who Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs. And he talks about the wisdom of his mother in, in Proverbs chapter 31. And the virtuous woman. That is written about Bathsheba. 
The woman who committed adultery with David. I'm just saying all of this to say that, you know what, some of you think, man, I've blown it. You can't, you can't blow it any more than David blew it. I doubt if any of you have done stuff as bad as David did. And yet, look, God took his mess and somehow or another worked it together for good. And you know what? We look at this and think, what a great life David had. What a great man he was. He certainly had his faults and he had problems. But overall, David was used of God. And today we still sing about the mercies of David and of the sweet psalmist of Israel. He's called the man after God's own heart. Look what God did with a person who wasn't his original choice. And even when this man messed up, look how God worked it out for good. And for four or five hundred years, people in the nation of Israel were blessed because God said, I will not take my mercies away from them because of David, my servant's sake. He made an everlasting covenant with David and David caused blessings to come on his descendants even when they weren't serving God and weren't doing what they should do. And all of this came through people who missed it big time. So I say all of these things as we start talking about how to find God's will to just encourage you that, you know what, you may have messed up. You may have done some things. There may be some people that say, well, man, I'm not sure I married the right person. It doesn't do you any good to go there now. You know what? You are married. And just like David and Bathsheba, you know what? Now you are committed. And that relationship, if you have humbled yourself, is sanctified. And you are wrong to just walk away from this relationship. You're wrong to sit there and say, well, I missed God back there 20 years ago. And so you just try and reverse your life and go back. You know, you are where you are. And you just need to humble yourself and start seeking God and say, God, you know, you can take where I am right now and work all of this together for good. You can make this work out. And, you know, regardless of what you've been through, I've met some people that have been through jail, have been through terrible things. And it wasn't God's will for what happened. And yet God can take that. And work it together for good. Now, God doesn't cause all of these negative things. That's not what I'm saying. But God can work it together for good. God can make it all work together. And so, I just want to encourage you. I know that I've stirred some people up and they go to thinking, well, what if? You know what, really? You can't go there. David could have beat himself up. And David could have sat there his whole time saying, what if? What if? I should have done this and all this. And David made serious, serious mistakes that caused him a lot of agony. And cost his wives and his sons a lot of agony. He had one son, Absalom, that killed another son, son, Abnon. And he had a daughter, Tamar, that was raped because he let this sexual sin in. And David could have beat himself up and David could have been so bad. And yet he just kept trusting God. He kept trusting God. He was strong in the grace that's in the Lord. And I am absolutely convinced that regardless of where you are today, regardless of how badly you have missed, God's plans not changed. You may be way over here when God wanted you to be over here, but you know what? God is at least as good as a GPS. (laughs) Have you ever made a wrong turn with a GPS and does it just freak out and stop and, ah, you missed it. You'll never get there now. No, if you make a wrong turn, a GPS will say, recalculating, amen, and it'll refigure, and it'll tell you to go, and it'll, it'll get you there. You can still get there. God's at least as good as GPS. It doesn't matter where you are, God can recalculate. God can take what you've done, and He can figure a way to get you back on track. The gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. That means God doesn't change. You may have changed, but God hasn't changed. God still has a plan for you, and God can recalculate and get you back on track. And you know, from our human perspective, we have seen people like, uh, there's a man, Dave Hinton, who just did our men's conference with us. He's a big six foot seven cowboy that sings. And Dave went to uh, prison and was in the demon's den. Singing when uh, this little old lady came and witnessed to him and he got born again. And Dave Hinton, is he's hilarious. But anyway, he talks about all of this stuff that happens. And you know what? 
I don't believe that God sent Dave Hinton to prison. I don't believe that God had Dave Hinton sing in the bars and the demon's den and do the things that he did. Dave, he, his stories, it's just unbelievable. He was, um, his father divorced his wife, David's mother, but um, I, don't, I think it was because of finances. They couldn't split up, and so he lived in the same house. But he and his wife were divorced. And he never claimed David. I think it was because of financial things, you know, having to do with child uh, dependence or something. He never claimed David as his son. David grew up calling his father Uncle Bud. He didn't know that he was his father. He thought he was his uncle.